Problem Child. That's a title that some people use in their private lives for other people. They sit in judgment about a person's life because they're not actually the ones living that individual's life. They talk about things, they gossip about things, they don't understand what can happen in a world when technology is in the hands of a major corporation. That major corporation might play ball with the wrong people, actually leaving to the desolation of an individual's life. I talk a lot about this because I believe we have the rights in this world to know what our technology is and isn't doing in performance for our jobs, our employment, our resource ability to build a network, and literally gain lawful employment. I met today with an HR director by casual accident at one of the local places, and it was sort of a fluke that I discovered I'd actually interviewed with her a long time ago and passed all the exams, but I just wasn't as comfortable with the legal ease of the document that I had assigned to be employed at a very low wage. I ended up in a different retail job, and that's just a little story, but what I'm talking about today is really how we help people. When we have proper help, we get on in life. When we have people who label us problem child and try to do the least amount of work to help people, that's something else totally different. I've reached out to several people in my homelessness. I've gone to churches, I've literally gone to synagogues, I've gone to organizations and non-for-profits. What I find is that they're pretty much one-hit wonders. I literally got fed a little breakfast this morning at two places. When I went to the first place, a man took food out of his car, but he didn't think about inviting me into the synagogue there to sit and worship with them or to literally just stay out of the cold for a little while. Nor was I offered, could they take me any place, could they help me travel, or anything like that. They didn't do it. Now maybe they thought I had a car, or maybe they didn't care. The other man provided me a loaf. I was able to share that loaf, much like Jesus did, at the next place I went that was having kind of a fellowship time. I feel badly because I literally commandeered some of the pastor's time, but she did an outstanding job representing her new little church. She hasn't been there all that long, but she sat with me like a loving person, talked with me, asked me really smart questions of how she could help, what were the most priorities that I needed to handle, and then she literally told me she couldn't help with anything. And that was okay, but she did try to understand. I do feel like we had a soulful connection, and openly when I asked her in the end, would I be welcome to worship there, she said absolutely. And that is something that I haven't experienced very often in my life. You see, in life we have people who say they love us and say they care for us, but then they do absolutely nothing on our plans. When we try and involve them in plans and we ask them questions, they're really too busy to hear us, to care, to listen. And then they do this sort of uh, <clears throat> lighting of people, this aspect of gaslighting, where they're openly trying to sabotage an individual's ability to get things accomplished. That is what some people do. They gaslight. They literally are lying and misdirecting and contradicting in a type of persistent denial to destabilize a quote-unquote victim or target and literally not allow them the prosperities and the opportunities that this land provides. When I talk about these things, people don't get it as why I'm going from marketing now into one or two areas of either reporting or pastoralship. The reason I want to go into pastoralship is pretty straightforward. People in my community need to have people like me talking about God and that God doesn't hate them, that God doesn't care about them is not true, that people represent the Lord in many places. And there's always a hundred some cars usually in a church parking lot, but there's always one or two people set up for the welcome wagon who often totally interfere with the person's rights to receive the, the blood of Christ, the help of God through other people. They really clear out a church without stopping people and saying, we've got a new friend here who's got some struggles. Let's wrap ourselves around and see what we can do without violating any personal rights. I had to ask to use the lavatory before I left that little church that fed me so kindly and because they had precisely what they need at every organization like that, a 70-year-old-ish man who knows how to welcome and enfold people. He was probably the second best that I've experienced in my life. The first bed was best was closer to the Keystone area, and I promoted him pretty well. His name was Mr. Remington, and I'll always remember that because of how he told me to and explained his name. He was wonderful, welcoming, and hospitable, and I can't get over that. But my point is that I asked to use the lavatory before I left because it's cold outside, and no one came over to introduce themselves or welcome me any more than the pastor was handling. And in reality, what they did was I was in the lavatory, and they shut the lights off on me. A man literally came in, used the stall next to me, and literally knew I was there and shut the lights off on me. 
I don't know that church, I don't know that bathroom, and I had to grasp for light just to get out of there. You see, there's always a satanic force in a church. The satanic force says that person's not welcome, that individual's not good enough, we are not providing anybody who's homeless or anybody who looks like that any assistance. I am going to stick around and nose my way into what's going on with the pastor who has to decide, is she going to protect confidentiality or is she going to violate trust in those moments? You see, in life we have moments of time to help people, and when we don't help people move on their path, they can get stuck. They don't get stuck on purpose. They get stuck because every person they go to literally says, sorry, not been there, done that, not going there again. Or literally they say, I'm sorry, this problem child is not my problem. I'm going to do the least amount of work possible to make sure that this person's life fails completely. I've seen that happen. I've seen people play the game of life on others without them acknowledging that the person didn't sign up for their version of that game. In my physical and mental and uh, intelligence of abilities, I see it clearly. As a reporter, I observe it and I render opinion in a column-like audio file. I'm trying to encourage the world to start taking accountability for their little moments of time when they see someone along the side of the road, they have an inkling that says, you could help that person, but then they ignore it completely because they're there with their spouse, they're there with a significant other, or they're there with their children, and they're not thinking about mentoring, mentoring or modeling appropriate behavior with someone who might be in need. You see, in life, we have moments of time to really help someone. There was two people today at the library that I asked for assistance. One said he'd go off and do my help and stuff, and he wandered off and never came back. The other little person sticked with it and helped me to fix the problem and solve the issue that I was trying to have, or that I wasn't trying to have, that I was having, with the technology that I was borrowing on the loan program that these places offer. My point is there's two types of customer service in every organization, regardless who, who pays the bills of that employee. Whether it's God or whether it's an actual paycheck, it's all about getting to help that individual accomplish their goals. I literally have family who says, I'm sure you'll figure it out. And then they throw it in my face, well, you won't talk to me about your problems, so I'm not going to help you. And it's a constant battle. It's a constant stress. It's constant gaslighting. It's constantly a making a person question their memory, their perception, or their sanity, and that's not really godly. There's nothing loving in that gaslighting play. There's nothing loving in trying to ruin a person's opportunities to be married or do anything else in life. You see, in moments of time, we have moments of time to show our Christ behavior through how we handle difficulties and opportunities in life. When a man simply says, I love you, you don't turn that into a police report every single time. You realize you maybe have failed someone, and you've probably failed them if they keep at it. Sure, there are stalkers who are immature in this world who do a lot of stuff, but then there's also old-school people who look at wooing somebody by just giving it their best shot every time the Lord prompts them. We have to look at those things in life. We have to figure out how to be Christ-like and more Christ-like in our responses and calling police is the least Christ-like possibility on the planet. I'm not pooping on police. I'm just saying they have not been trained in social etiquette by any way, shape, or form. Most of them are used to walking into a room and commanding the situation because of their little peacock uniform, which I like to call it, because openly they do strut about, at least around my presence. I have met some wonderful police when my son was having struggles. The man's name was Michael, and he was the most incredible police officer I'd ever met, and he helped so much in those days. He understood the parent's perspective, he understood the son's perspective, and he literally tried to make a peace in the world. He left the business, though, because of what he was seeing going on in the, in the industry. Now, that's an observation from an actual police officer. When I was in Ohio, another police officer was very kind at a church that was welcoming and unfolding, and literally said, we kind of have a ranking in Ohio for our levels of excellence. And they base it based on the actual parameters in which that person operates as an officer. I found that interesting, but I'm not going to disparage the police force anymore. What I'm really saying is that when people have moments of time to help others, they better step up and do it because the Lord might be watching and saying, you know that person and you're not helping? Wow, maybe we shouldn't allow you a prize that the Lord had planned for your life because you just said, I am not going there ever again or I will never talk to that person again. Really? Why not? 
What is it that you're showing in such maturity in front of the house of the Lord that makes sense to this? Now, what I find fascinating in these technology centers is that these little computers can time out sometimes. And openly, that's not really fair. In life, we have moments of time to help people, and that's all I ever talk about. Those moments are not fleeting. They occur literally every single day. We also have to think about time management, absolutely. And that pastor was loving and kind and literally gave up her time with her actual parish to speak with me. But you know what? That's precisely what Jesus would have done, I think. She also was very kind to allow me to use the facilities and turn my time. And her choir director or whoever she was with at the end was very loving in her responses. It could have all been a play. It could have all been theatrical. It could have all been, we're just going to make the best presence because we're representing the house of God here. But that's okay. The person who shut the lights off me in the john, making me literally have to grope for my belongings and try and figure my way out of there, was unkind and a satanic force in that place. It was a man, I'm quite sure, because I was in the men's room. And openly, he was still standing there and looked sheepish as I left. Men play these games, and it's inappropriate and it's immoral. And she needs to address that in her next pastoral sermon. Or they need to allow people like me who come in with lay pastor skills to present in a way that they feel it, that they understand Christ is not in those plays. Now, in moments of time, we have time to help people. We have time to harm people. You only have to decide which line are you walking on. Are you walking with the satanic force that says, I will do the absolute minimum on this guy because he's pissed me off because I'm boyering in on his life or I'm interfering with his life? Or are we going to represent the highest level of love in the land, which is openly the blood of Jesus Christ for those of us who are in that sort of lineage of Christianity and for any other philosophy that's out there like Kabbalah, they have the same philosophy. It's just called something different. Even in the Quran, it talks about helping the impoverished. Even in the Indian cultures, there are those opportunities. But you have moments of time to make a huge difference for someone, making a phone call, saying stop this now before it gets ugly, and all that sort of stuff is important. We can rebuke people for their adolescence, we can rebuke people for their strangeness, but openly, in the end, the soul belongs to the Lord. And what the Lord pushes on people to do is to try to manage their time in better ways so that they're openly helping more people in life, not only in their jobs, but later. Interestingly enough, the HR director I was talking to was actually looking like she was looking for a job for something, which means she wasn't as content in her position either at her age, and she hadn't provided herself enough for retirement either, I'm guessing. You see, we all are focused in the day-to-day -day of life, and we're not thinking about two retirements. One, our physical retirement in this world, or other retirement and spirituality retirement in the next. Thanks for listening.